In this video, I discuss an experiment related to knotweed injection. Injecting herbicide into the hollow stems of invasive knotweed is a very common way to treat it. Although injection can be very successful in controlling knotweed, it does have shortcomings. Two in particular. First, it is recommended that you inject every stem over a half inch in diameter in a patch of knotweed. Injecting that many stems is laborious. Second, it is recommended you inject a large amount of undiluted glyphosate concentrate in each stem. The typical glyphosate label recommends 5 milliliters, although other sources recommend 3. Either way, this is a lot of herbicide. If you inject 5 mil, that's about 15 times the amount of herbicide used for an equally effective foliar application according to one reputable study. Therefore, it makes sense for us to look for ways to make knotweed injections less laborious and to reduce the amount of herbicide they use. The impetus for the experiment proposed in this video came out of a recent injection of glyphosate I did to a small plot of knotweed. I did the injections last summer during a severe drought. The injected stems all died. These are to the left of the dotted red line in the photo. It may look like some of the knotweed on the left survived, but the green that is visible is from grapevine leaves. Much more interesting, however, was that a large number of nearby knotweed stems that were untreated also died. Some of those stems were as far as eight feet from the injected ones. Although I can't prove this, it seems likely that glyphosate was translocated from the injected stems to the untreated ones and killed them. My hypothesis is that the drought encouraged the transfer of liquid, including the injected glyphosate, from the treated stems to the untreated ones. This led to the question, is there a way to recreate the effect of the drought? How can we encourage a knotweed clone to share carbon from injected stems with untreated parts of the clone? Cutting knotweed stems might have a somewhat similar effect on the knotweed clone as drought. We know that when knotweed stems are cut, the knotweed clone will quickly replace those lost stems with new ones. In generating the replacements for the cut stems, does the knotweed clone borrow non-structural carbon from vigorously growing parts of the clone? If so, cutting could draw herbicide from treated to untreated parts of the clone. One way to test this hypothesis would be to set up a plot as shown in this slide. Cut half the stems in each clump, but don't treat them. The remaining uncut stems in each clump could then be injected with herbicide. Another plot could be cut or treated on a clump by clump basis, i.e. treat one entire clump and then cut and not treat a nearby clump. The advantage of this method is that it would be easier to cut entire clumps as opposed to selectively cutting stems within a clump. You could more easily use, for example, a brush cutter to cut an entire clump. The downside could be that the herbicide would have to travel farther from a treated clump to an untreated one. Next summer, I'm going to test out whether cutting a knotweed stem but not treating it will draw herbicide from a nearby treated stem. If anyone has tried something similar, please comment below.